Well, good morning again. We have a special guest with us. If you were not here for the Navigating Crisis Conference, you missed out. Pastor Bruce Ray is going to be speaking to us this morning on Christ alone. It is a pleasure to be with you. I bring you greetings from Juanita Community Church in Kirkland, Washington. And I emphasize Kirkland because if you go to Costco, what do you buy? Kirkland Signature. And Kirkland Signature was born in Kirkland, Washington, store number one. So when you buy your water or other Kirkland Signature products, please pray for Juanita Community Church. We are glad to be with you. My wife and I always love coming to Denver once we learn to breathe. <laughs> but uh, I, I really want to share with you the, the most wonderful thing that we find in Denver, in all honesty, is you. We enjoy being here with you. We enjoy visiting our friends. Uh, Rick and Julie are not our only friends in Denver, but we enjoy staying with them. I've known others of your elders for a number of years, and it is uh, just a joy to be with you, and to worship with you, and to join together with you in praise and prayer, and uh, to look unto our Savior. Would you open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 23? Let's pray together. Our Father, we have gathered on this first day of the week, as your people have done for over 2,000 years, in celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus from the dead, in celebration of the victory that he obtained for us, in celebration of all of the many spiritual blessings that have been poured out upon us in Christ. We come to give you praise. We come to be reminded of the greatness of your majesty and your power. We come to hear again the, the story of salvation and how unrighteous men can be justified and stand before you with no condemnation. O oh Lord, give me clarity as I preach this morning. Give me the unction or the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us all ears to hear. Make us ready to receive in our minds and our hearts the truth of your word. Humble us. Exalt Jesus in our midst. And make today the day of rejoicing in salvation for your people. And Lord, we pray that you would make today the day of salvation for those who may be here and do not know you. May your spirit come upon them. May your spirit work within them. May they come to repentance and true faith to the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am blessed to have been assigned the topic that is before us this morning, Solus Christus. You've been going through a series on the solas of the Reformation. You recognize the derivatives of sola alone. Solus Christus is Latin for in Christ alone. That we are saved by Christ alone stands at the very core of Reformation theology. And not just Reformation theology, at the center of biblical theology. Many passages tell us and demonstrate and affirm that great truth. 
the whole book of Colossians was written primarily to exalt and demonstrate the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all things. We read this morning Philippians chapter 3, and Philippians chapter 2 is a magnificent proclamation of the full deity and the full humanity of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he obtained for us by his obedience unto death, even death on the cross. There is the testimony of the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 4 when he said, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We can turn to the words of our Lord himself who said in John chapter 3, verse 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Or the words of our Lord in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you understand the offense of the gospel to the world around us? Do you see that the offense of the gospel and the offense of the Reformation is not so much in the doctrines that we proclaim as in sola? Nobody will fight us over whether Christ is a savior or not if we call him a savior, a prophet, a teacher. If that's what you want to believe, that's fine. But it's when you say that there's no other way, none, no other truth, none, no other life, none, then people become offended. We can fill our churches to overflowing if we talk about the the values and the standards and the morals and the ethics and the gentleness and the kindness and the goodness of our Savior until we say there's no one else. There's no one else. But I'm not going to turn to those passages. I want to approach the topic today from a a different direction. I want you to understand that solus Christus is not only a Reformation concept or even a New Testament concept. It is a teaching of the Word of God that the only way men have ever been saved or ever could be saved is by solus Christus in Jesus Christ. Look with me now at just one passage in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 3, 23, verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you've scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you've done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved 
and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. When Jeremiah wrote these words, time was running out for the nation of Judah. Judah's kings had failed the Lord, and they had failed the people. And God had turned against them because of their great wickedness. At the risk of appearing to be unpatriotic in a time of war, Jeremiah spoke against the governing royal house of David and counseled the citizens of Jerusalem to come out from the city and surrender to the Babylonians who were besieging them. We read in chapter 21 of Jeremiah, verses 1 through 10, that the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, son of Malachijah, and the priest Zephaniah, son of Maaseah. They said, inquire now of the Lord for us, because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders or, or miracles for us as in times past, so that he will withdraw from us. But Jeremiah answered them, tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them inside this city, and I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both men and animals, and they will die of a terrible plague. After that, declares the Lord, I will hand over Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the people in this city who survive the plague, sword and famine, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who seek their lives. He will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy, no pity, or compassion. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. He will escape with his life. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. In chapter 22, Jeremiah makes specific prophecies of God's judgments against three of the kings ruling over Judah in the days immediately preceding their captivity. O. Palmer Robertson, in his book, The Christ of the Prophets, summarizes this chapter this way. He says, Jeremiah's predictions of a coming messianic king relate directly to the expectation of restoration after exile. The prophet issues a series of condemning judgments aimed at the various kings ruling over Judah in the days immediately preceding their national exile. These kings failed in their solemn responsibility as mediators of God's covenant with David and so shall experience devastation. King Jehoaz, also known as Shalom, will die in exile and never have the privilege of seeing the promised land again. King Jehoiakim will have the burial of a donkey being dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. King Jehoiakim will be handed over to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, hurled into a foreign country, and never returned to the promised land. None of his offspring will sit on the throne of David. These scandalous shepherds are responsible for scattering and destroying God's sheep. That's what Jeremiah is pointing out 
in chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. When he says, woe to the shepherds, that's who he's talking about. These kings who failed in their responsibilities under God. They are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you've done this, because you've scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not bestowed care in them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. God is bringing judgment upon the people. God is bringing judgment upon the kings. God is bringing judgment upon the nation. He says in verses 3 and 4, I myself will gather the remnant out of my flock, out of all the countries. They're going into exile. They'll be in exile for a long period of time, some 70 years. And then God will restore them to the land himself. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. And it's in this context of judgment and restoration that Jeremiah, in a striking contrast to these unrighteous kings, introduces Christ Jesus, our hope. He speaks of the branch that he will raise up to David. He speaks of the king who will reign wisely. He speaks of the one who will bring salvation and safety. And he says, this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. Calvin says, we must now then understand that this passage cannot be explained of any but of Christ only. The expectation of and the longing for a singular individual anointed and sent by God to be the Savior of his people is nothing new with Jeremiah. In fact, it's quite old almost as old as the earth itself, reaching back to that initial promise, that proto-evangel, that first announcement of the gospel in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, where God promised that the seed of the woman would do what? Would crush the serpent's head. The serpent would crush his heel. The snake, the devil... The evil one, the enemy of God, would crush the heel of the son of the woman. That would be painful. But the son of the woman will crush the serpent's head. That is death. That is destruction. That is total victory over the evil one. Adam and Eve had that promise. And the remainder of the Old Testament is but the unfolding and the opening up of that flower. It is the progressive revealing of the person and the character and the work of the Messiah that God will send and the narrowing of his identity, telling us even the place of his birth so that he may be known and recognized when he comes as the only one who fulfills the promises and the prophecies of God. Verses 5 and 6 again tell us who he is, the branch, the king, the one who provides salvation and safety for his people. He is named the Lord our Righteousness. That is Jehovah Sidkenu. If you have your 
your Bible open, you see that the word Lord is in small caps. And in our English versions, that's how they designate the term, the name, the four-letter name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh. I am who I am. He is Jehovah, our righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu. And if Jehovah Sidkenu, I want to just make three obvious observations this morning. And I want to remind you right up from the beginning that Paul makes that connection. He makes it very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, where he says it's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Jeremiah promises Jehovah Sidkenu will come. Those who believed that promise, those who believed the promise of God in Genesis chapter 3, those who through all the centuries of the old covenant were looking forward to the coming of the promised Messiah, were saved by that Messiah alone, believing in the Messiah that God would send. Paul writes and says that promise is fulfilled. That promise, that expectation is reality. Christ has come and he is our righteousness. He is Jehovah Sidkenu. So first this morning, if Jehovah Sidkenu, if Jesus Christ is our righteousness then it must be because we have no righteousness of our own. What is righteousness? Righteousness is a kind of a broad term with many shades of meaning when applied to different circumstances. But the root concept of the word righteousness is straight. And it's from that concept that righteousness has the idea of conforming to and not deviating from a standard. We measure something, we want to make sure it's straight. And I'm sure when they built this structure, they were very careful to make sure that none of the pillars were off even a little bit. Because in order to support the structure, it needs to be in conformity with the standard. And we are called upon to conform to the standard. God is righteous. He must be true to the standard. But God, in being righteous, must be true to himself and not deviate from the standard of who he is. That's the scripture tells us that God Cannot what? God cannot lie. Why not? Because he is the truth. He is the standard. Human righteousness, however, is different. Human righteousness is not being true to yourself because we are not straight. Human righteousness is being true to the standard that God has prescribed for men and women and boys and girls. Human righteousness is being true. Human righteousness is being conformed to God's word or God's law. Well, Adam and Eve were created in true righteousness, but they failed the probationary test of obeying God's word with respect to the tree of knowledge and the tree of good and evil in the garden. Spurgeon said, man by the fall sustained an infinite loss in the matter of righteousness. He suffered the loss of a righteous nature 
and then a twofold loss of legal righteousness in the sight of God. Man sinned. He was therefore no longer innocent of transgression. Man did not keep the command. He therefore was guilty of the sin of omission. In that which he committed and in that which he omitted, his original character for uprightness was completely wrecked. Adam and Eve plunged themselves and all of their posterity into an estate of sin and misery. Righteousness, the righteousness that God requires of us, is the righteousness revealed in his law, notably summarized in the Ten Commandments. But in the fall, we lost not only our standing, we lost our ability to conform to the law of God. We are naturally inclined towards sin. The law now serves the function of showing us how far short we fall. Romans, in Romans, Paul tells us that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you thought about what it means? Does it mean that we have sinned and therefore we are less than God? We fall short of the glory of God? I don't think that's what Paul has in mind there. I think what Paul is telling us, we are are made in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, what is unique about us as human beings? What do we have that the, the animal kingdom does not have? We are not animals. We're not part of the animal kingdom because of this and this alone. What is it? The image of God. We are made in the image of God. And just as the moon reflects the glory of the sun, we are made to reflect the glory of our maker. We are made to reflect the glory of God. So when Paul says we fall short of the glory of God, I don't think he's saying you're less than God, so you've fallen. We never were to be gods in the beginning. I think what he's saying is that we fall short of that for which we have created we fall short of the glory that God intended us to bear as the bearers of his image. We have fallen. We are no longer straight. We are warped. We are crooked. We are bent in a different direction, in a destructive direction. Nonetheless, each of us thinks by nature that we can or ought to be able to do well enough. Well enough. We tend to look upon ourselves as the center of the universe. At the appointed time in Genesis chapter 4, the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, both assembled, came to worship the Lord, to bring an offering. Abel brought what was the acceptable offering from his flock, a blood offering. Cain brought an offering from his harvest not the prescribed offering, not an acceptable offering. But Cain brought that because he thought it should be good enough for God. Thinking that he set the standard, not God. When you talk to your neighbors and you talk to them about heaven and hell and eternal things and the judgment of God. What's the common response that you get? I realize some will vary from this, but isn't it along the lines of, well, I hope when I stand before God that my good works will outweigh my bad works 
and that will be good enough for God. Still thinking that I set the standard. I don't. God set the standard. The standard is revealed in his word, and when I look honestly at that standard and compare it to my life, I fall short. You fall short. We all, by nature, fall short. We need righteousness to stand before God, but we don't have that righteousness in ourselves, and we can't earn that righteousness, and we can't buy that righteousness, and we can't flatter each other into righteousness. We stand before God naked and ashamed. George Whitfield said that whoever is acquainted with the nature of mankind in general or the propensity of his own heart in particular must acknowledge that self-righteousness is the last idol that is rooted out of the heart. Being once born under a covenant of works, it is natural for us all to have recourse to a covenant of works for our everlasting salvation. And we have contracted such a devilish pride by our fall from God that we would, if not holy, yet in part at least, glory in being the cause of our own salvation. We cry out against popery, and that very justly. But we are all papists, at least I am sure we are all Arminians by nature. Interesting observation. The natural man's religion. And therefore, no wonder so many natural men embrace that scheme. This is the sorest, though alas, the most common evil that was ever yet seen under the sun. The very name of the Messiah. Rules out any hope of saving ourselves. Rules out any hope of being good enough in our own strength to obtain the approval of God. The name of Messiah is the Lord, our righteousness. He is Jehovah Sidkenu. So our second observation this morning is this. If Jehovah Sidkenu is our righteousness, if Jesus Christ is our righteousness, then righteousness must be of the essence of his character and not merely an attribute. Jehovah Sidkenu is a name, not a description. That is, Jeremiah doesn't come to verse 6 and say, this one who is coming, this branch, this king, will be righteous. He's not describing him. He's saying that his name is the Lord, our righteousness. And you know that in the scriptures, a name goes to the issue of the character of the bearer of that name. And therefore, righteousness pertains to the character and the identity of our Messiah, not just a description of what he's like, not just one of his attributes. And it's this truth that the Lord is our righteousness, that, that, that his name is our righteousness that brought the prophet Isaiah to his knees. Do you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, Isaiah tells us that in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, or if you prefer the King James, seraphim, the Hebrew plural, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. In the presence of God's holiness, Isaiah instantly saw that he was what? He was not holy. When we compare ourselves to each other, we can come off pretty well. Well, I may not be perfect, but I'm not like that guy. I may not be perfect, but I don't, I don't do that. I'd never be caught in that place. And we can, we can kind of self-justify ourselves. I'm a pretty good guy. But when we stand in the presence of him who is truly righteous, altogether righteous, of him who is by his very nature righteousness all of that unravels and that's what's happening to Isaiah here in chapter 6 he is unraveling and he says in verse 5 woe to me I'm ruined For I am a man of unclean lips. And speaking of unclean lips, he's not saying he has a potty mouth. He's he's saying that, that, that he is through and through an unclean, unrighteous, unholy man. And I live among a people of unclean lips. It's not true only of me. It's true of all of us. Every one of us. Without exception. With no difference. Money doesn't make us righteous. Position doesn't make us righteous. Power doesn't make us righteous. Success in a worldly way doesn't make us righteous. An accumulation of possessions doesn't make us righteous. Being thought of as a nice guy doesn't make us righteous. We are all together. Unclean. Before the Lord. He says, I, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And when Isaiah says, woe to me, do you understand what he's expecting? It's not, it's not just a, a small measure of woe. Isaiah says, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And Isaiah understood that no man can see God. He expected to die. He expected to be struck dead. He expected maybe to be hit by a bolt of lightning. Whatever God might use as a means, he did not expect to live. Having seen what he's seen. Then in verse 6 of Isaiah 6, one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth, my unclean lips, and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The righteous one. brought righteousness to his servant. And Isaiah understood, and we should understand, that only God can make us clean. Only God can justify us. Only God can give us righteousness. We must have a righteousness 
that is apart from the law, at least apart from our keeping of the law, a righteousness that comes from a source other than ourselves, a righteousness that comes from a source other than each other, a righteousness whose only source is God himself. The righteousness that we need comes from him. Jehovah Sidkenu doesn't mean, that is the meaning of the word, the meaning of the name is not God is righteous, that would be Zedekiah. Or even that God is righteousness. It means God, it means Jehovah is our righteousness. The ooh at the end of the word is a plural personal pronoun, possessive. He is our righteousness in the plural. That means for each of us, he must be my righteousness. I must have that righteousness to be able to stand in the presence of the righteous one. The righteousness we need, the righteousness that God requires of us is not divine righteousness. We cannot be God. We need human righteousness. We need perfect conformity to the revealed will or law of God. But that can't come from us. This righteousness is the righteousness that Messiah provides. Verse 5 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch. The word branch here is the word zemach. It's not what we would typically call a branch protruding from a tree, from the trunk of the tree, but it's a shoot or a sprout. There used to be a publisher called Creation House, and I like their logo. I don't think they're in business anymore, but their logo was, if you can picture it, a tree stump. Tree shot off, cut off, flat stump. A tree stump and a little shoot coming out of it. A little shoot coming out of it. Leish, in his commentary on Jeremiah, says that zemach, the Hebrew term, never denotes a twig, an individual branch of a tree, but a growth a sprout that grows directly out of the ground or directly from a root, forming a new or a second plant or tree. Though a son of David, this branch will not be a mere branch in the family tree of David. He will be established as a fresh growth, springing up from the seemingly dead root of the house of David, growing up by the power of the omnipotent God, into a new tree. But the son of David is himself Jehovah. The son of God, the son of man, is himself Jehovah incarnate. And here is the mystery of the two natures in one person. Calvin says the son of David and Jehovah is one and the same Redeemer. Christ is set forth here in his twofold character so that the prophet brings before us both the glory of his divinity and the reality of his humanity. This is what we celebrate at Christmas, is it not? Some people make Christmas simply a celebration of childhood. In Brazil, it's not Christmas when they do this, but in Brazil they have Children's Day. And Children's Day is a bigger day than Christmas in terms of gift giving and that kind of thing. The kids get virtually anything they want. But Christmas is or ought to be the celebration of the incarnation of the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son comes into the world, not now in a temporary theophany, 
not now in an in appearance, a temporary Christophany appearing in the form of a man, but now Christ actually takes upon himself true manhood. He becomes a man. For what purpose? To do for men what men cannot do for themselves. To do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Spurgeon comments, We therefore assert, believing that Scripture fully warrants us, that the life of Christ constitutes the righteousness in which his people are to be clothed. This is, a, this is a big concept that we don't often think of. When we think of what Christ has done for us, where do our, our thoughts go, most of us? To the cross, right? So many of our hymns celebrate, rightly so, the cross. We see the cross at the core of the preaching of the gospel, and, and rightfully it is. But in going directly to the cross, what have we missed? The 30-some years leading up to the cross, in which Christ was not inactive with respect to our salvation, but doing what? When he came to be baptized by John, John didn't want to do it, right? I'm not worthy. Jesus told him it's necessary. Why? Why? Jesus didn't tell him, oh, it's okay, John, you're, you're worthy enough. He said to him, it is necessary to do what? To fulfill all what? Righteousness. Jesus, in being baptized for the remission of sins, he had no sins. What he did, he did for us. Indeed, all of his days, what he did, he did for us. Jesus was a keeper of the law. He kept the law as a man for us. Adam and Eve fell. We cannot perfectly keep the law. Jesus did what we cannot do for us. He perfectly kept the law. And in doing that, he obtained not merely divine righteousness. He possessed divine righteousness as the second person of the Trinity. But what he did by living for us was to obtain human righteousness for us. And in that righteousness, we can be wrapped we can be clothed. We can be covered. And we can have all the blessings. If Jehovah Sidkenu, if Jesus Christ is our righteousness, and if he is the only source of human righteousness, the righteousness that God demands of every man, woman, and child, then without Jesus Christ, without Jehovah Sidkenu, you cannot have any righteousness. And if you do not have righteousness, then you cannot have forgiveness. You cannot have cleansing. You cannot have peace with God. You cannot have that peace of God. You cannot have joy in this life. And you cannot have the joys of eternal life in heaven. You cannot have salvation, safety, or security. But in Christ, we have all of that and more. This is why there can be no other redeemer. This is why our righteousness is only in Jehovah, only in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is solus Christus. There can be 
no other. Robert Murray McShane is well known as a godly man, a preacher who died in early in life. He wrote a hymn, and uh, I was going to check it to see if I could find it online in some hymnal. I have not, in my experience, found it in any hymnals, but I did find it, and, and we set it to a tune in our church. We sing it to the tune. For those of you who are musicians, we sing this to the tune of Joanna. For those of you who don't recognize the tune name, I always know that tune name because it's one of my daughters. She didn't write it, but that's her name. But um, it's sung to the tune of immortal, invisible, God only wise. Very common tune. Listen to the words from McShane. And ask yourself as I read this, is this my experience? I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture of Christ on the tree, Jehovah said, Kenu, was nothing to me. I oft read with pleasure to soothe or engage Isaiah's wild measure and John's simple page. But even when they pictured the blood-sprinkled tree, Jehovah said, Kenu, if you want to substitute Jesus, my Savior, seemed nothing to me. People can read the Bible, enjoy reading the Bible, and it means nothing. Like tears from the daughters of Zion that roll, I wept when the waters went over his soul. Yet thought not that my sins had nailed to the tree. Jehovah said, Kenu. It was nothing to me. When free grace awoke me by light from on high, then legal fears shook me. I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self could I see. Jehovah said, Kenu, my Savior must be. My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fears banished. With boldness I came to drink at the fountain, life-giving and free. Jehovah said, Kenu, is all things to me. Jehovah said, Kenu, my treasure and boast. Jehovah said, Kenu, I ne'er can be lost. And thee I shall conquer by flood and by field, my cable, my anchor, my breastplate, and shield, even treading the valley, the shadow of death, this watchword shall rally my faltering breath. For while from life's fever my God sets me free, Jehovah said Kenu, my death song shall be. Jesus, my Savior, Jehovah said Kenu. Do you know him? I don't mean do you know about him. We can learn all things about him. We can know all about him. We can describe his life. We can describe his character. We can maybe quote large portions of scripture. But do you know him? Have you come to him? Have you embraced him? Have you found righteousness, forgiveness, cleansing, and transforming power in him. Does he dwell in you? Oh, come to the Savior. Come to the Savior. You don't need to make an appointment. You don't need to check your schedule. You don't need to drive a long distance. You can come to him right where you are. And you can come to him right now. You don't need to come up to the front. You don't need to put up your hand. You don't need to sign a line in your Bible. You don't need to pray a formatted prayer. You just need to come to him. Come to him. He is receptive. 
He says that no one who comes to him will be turned away. If you know about Jesus but don't know him, or if you know nothing about Jesus but now you want to, come to him. If you have questions, if you need help, the elders of this church are wonderful men. I don't know every one of them personally, but the ones I do know are truly wonderful men. I am blessed to count them as my friends. They are men I trust. They are men you can trust. They are good soul keepers. They are good people to care for your soul. They do care, and they do love you. And if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have burdens that you can't seem to let go, come to them. They will guide you. They can't do it for you, but they will guide you, and they will point you to the one who can. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, what a blessing it is to have your word. Thank you for not giving your revelation in creation and then leaving us to our own devices. Thank you for sending prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers, those who open up your word to teach us. We praise you for every word that's been preserved by your spirit. We pray, Lord, that our hearts may lay open before you and that you would draw us by your mighty power in the greatness of your love that you lavish upon us in Jesus Christ. Make us yours that we may claim you as ours. To the glory of your holy name we, we pray.